Welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to the space. Uh, I'm happy to have you all here. Uh, I'll go ahead and start. Uh, I'll go ahead and open up the space by uh, saying the fakatapu, and then I'll introduce our note takers and chat moderators. Uh, I'll do a little introduction for Final, and then I'll let Final take the floor. All right. So, I run my tush alone. Fakatapu kieho eki wakumea. Fakatuloatu kia haa taki lotu moha fai fakao tulo moha poto kapunake moha taoke eta mokwa moku e fanga magi e ni. Okay. That was just a little fakatapu. Just open up the space. Uh, I want to thank everybody for being here tonight. Um, our note taker, uh, we'll, we will have notes taken after the recording. Um, thank you, Pauline, for being our chat moderator and is, and uh, also for recording the the Talanoa. And I'm just gonna just gonna do some quick housekeeping real quick um, for the Zoom etiquette. Uh, you can have your mic or camera on and on or off. Uh, feel free to use the chat box. We usually take a group photo at the end, so you know, feel free to to um, turn your camera on or off, whatever you prefer. Uh, you know, come as you are. Um, this is a safe space. Uh, we have a Google Classroom and the IG group chat. Uh, we'll drop those links in the chat uh, when you have them. Uh, we'd also welcome you to invite your friends and family. Uh, it's definitely a plus to have parents and elders here. Definitely a bonus for us as we try to learn the Tongan language. Uh, and also, if you if you have any guest speakers in mind, uh, we do have a guest speaker list where you're more than welcome to. Uh, to add that person, just be aware that if you add the person, you will be doing the, the facilitating. Okay, and lastly, just wanna talk about Tahi Avai real quick. Um, this is a safe space for self-learning and self-teaching. You know, we're all learning, we're all at different um, places in our in our learning journey. Um, so we're all coming from different levels. So please share what you know and be respectful of others. Uh, we welcome open-mindedness and others' experiences and perspectives. <clears throat> And if there's something that's said in Tala Noa that uh, makes you feel uncomfortable or anything like that, please reach out to us to let us know. Um, we're always trying to make this a more, um, we're always trying to make this uh, a more inviting space. Yeah, and then also uh, what, uh, let us know what we can do to take care of our relationships in this space. We're always uh, flexible to change and we're always open to suggestions. Yeah, okay, now that we got that, that out of the way, um, I will just go ahead and introduce Finau, and then Finau has some slides that she'd like to uh, talk about, and then we can open up the Q&A session. Okay, so most of you are familiar with Finau um, and her work in the community, the Greater Bay Area. Um, she really needs no introduction. Um, but for those of you who haven't had the pleasure of knowing Finau, um, I'll, I'll just give you a introduction. Uh, Dr. Finau Sina Tesa Tovo is a Tongan American scholar born and raised in East Palo Alto to Reverend Yumisi Tovo, who hails from the villages of Maufanga, Olomotua, and Fuamotu. 
working in the California Community College System for 10 years, Final Sina coordinated the Mana Pacific Studies Learning Community, which specializes in college navigation, retention, and transfer success of Pacific Islander students. Final Sina earned her education, her EDD, with the completion of her dissertation entitled Talanoa Amana, Validating Oceania Voices in a Pacific Studies Learning Community. In May 2020, Dr. Towa's research, in May 2020, Dr. Towa's research has been recognized by the American Education Research Association, the U.S. Pacific Islander Studies, Studies Association, the Tongan Research Association, and the Ministry of Education in Tonga. Currently, Final Sina is the Mana Learning Community Coordinator and a professor in counseling success and Pacific studies at the College of San Mateo. Additionally, Final Sina is the coordinator of the California Community College Mana Network which she consults with uh, community colleges who wish to show their support towards the NHPI student community. Additionally, Dr. Tovo serves on the Pacific Studies Curriculum Planning Committee and the U.S. Higher Education System, a member of the Tongan Research Association, San Mateo County Pacific Islander Initiative, and a member of the Bay Area Regional Pacific Islander Task Force. She's a proud first-generation college graduate of the University of California Riverside for her BA, San Jose State University for her master's and San Francisco State University for her doctorate, who puts her scholarship privilege into action, uh, into such actions protecting Mauna Kea, the movement for Black Lives, and in collaboration with the Center of Pacific Studies at the University of Hawaii, Manoa, Dr. Tovo is, contributing, is a contributing author to the Teaching Oceania series book, which she can tell us about a little bit later. And um, yeah, so that's just a little introduction uh, for Finau. But I'll go ahead and put the slides up and uh, give her the floor. Thank you, Siate. Okay, can you see the slides? Yeah. Okay. Like I can see your your back, like your background too, if that's okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Wow. So crazy. There you go. You want to go to the front front though? Yeah. It's hella. I, you know what? I'm not gonna be saying all that, y'all. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's okay. Hello, words on the slide, because as an instructor, I know that sometimes when we have conversations, it's better for you to kind of like read through it. But I'm gonna just, you know, nonchalantly talk about it, like I'm talking about my cousins. Um, I just wanted to first and foremost um, give space to everyone. Um, And in this sacred space of being able to ch change time and space and the rhythm of how we talk and the space that we're trying to bring in together, you know, I uh, just continue to keep my ancestors in mind, um, the land that I currently am a settler on, uh, land of Ramatush, Ohlone, uh, Ohlone territory, the people of Ramatush and to acknowledge the land of the uh, Ohlone territory, to acknowledge scholars that are beyond our times, um, like Dr. Epeli Ofa, and scholars who are here in our times and in our midst. I see Dr. I see Dr. Lee Nora Kava on, on here. Thank you for being here, sis. Um, and I apologize if I am missing anyone else who, who, are, who should be acknowledged. But I'm actually really excited to have this conversation today because let's be real, as a Tongan doing a lot of work here in the Bay Area, we all understand like you cannot just be Tongan, right? You gotta be EPA in, you gotta be Bay Area in, you also have to be a teacher, you also have to be a mother, like all these other um, spaces that, that we can be in, but like, for tonight, I'm just really excited that I can really talk about Tonga, hey? Like, I don't have to, like, I don't, I think I'm the kind of person that I've always felt like in order for me to give everyone a voice, I needed to be quiet. Or I needed to be um, in this particular place where I need to be respectful to those who are around. So as I'm trying to be respectful, I'm also trying to advocate 
for how unique and distinct Tongan methodology, Tongan concepts, and Tongan epistemology is into research. When, when Shate first asked me to do a Talanoa, I was like, oh shoot, I have to follow Dr. David Takaili. I have to follow almost Dr. Esteli Haufoka, and I'm going to tie my academic genealogies with them too, if that's okay. Esteli Hafoka is someone that has really taught me a lot about Tonga, about diaspora, and about religion. Um, and of course, our, our, our identity. David Kaili is one of my mentors um, in Tava, in, in the theory of Tava theory of reality. And I am also a proud Tavaist. I think that's the word of it, even though I don't really know what that means. But you know, it's something like that. It's we're gonna just keep moving along. <laughs> I'll make sense, I promise. And for my talk today, I wanted to talk about research and reimagining a colonial space through intensive Talanoa and Pacific methodology. Uh, can you go to the next one, uh, Shatem? And in order for me to talk about research, I want you guys to understand that I'm not just some random, I am random, but I'm not just some person coming off the streets talking about um, education and talking about practice. That's, that's my main focus is this practice part. And how does that develop into theory or how does that develop into college success? College success. So the MANA, Learn, the MANA program is a Pacific Studies learning community at the College of San Mateo in the San, in San Mateo Bay Area. If you are, are from if, if you're familiar, and if you're not from the U.S., we're we are a treasury level school. So we're like the two year before they're going to a four year uh, um, uh, university. And within these 10 last 10 years, I've been working with Pacifica students, um, and not in the classroom more in like student services and practicing how to support students as we go. I realized thinking back at this, before I even became a researcher, I just really went with what my culture has taught me. Um, what we have always understood growing up, um, we didn't really understand the theoretical parts of why we do the things we do in church for 12 hours a day. We just knew we had to do it. And when we were building this program, that's how it was. It literally was from the ground up and trying to figure out how can I help my students. So I would like to say that the grounding notion for being able to make a mana learning community or Vakatasi Pacifica community is that it has to start from the community. And it has to start your practices of being able to support students in education cannot be from education. And I'm gonna say that again, in order for you to support students in education, the, the help cannot be uh, trained by education. It has to come from the community, it has to come from outside. So how did the MANA program become this thing? Basically, I was taught this in my youth program at my, at, at my church. I've been um, Shaswesliana Metotisi um, here in the Bay Area since I was since, since I was born, and I have been raised at Falihifanganyana Methodist Church. So we all understand if you're not married by 21, you in youth until you're 50, or we you know or however old you get to be when you in youth, but you in youth until you married, and even if you married. And they still might tell you to come back to youth, youth, youth day, you know? So with all of these things of me being able to take care of people, feed people, nourish them, talk to them, uh, take them home when they need to, bring them to church when they need to, right? All of these concepts, literally, I transferred it from my church into education. Can you go to the next slide? I promise it's going to make sense. But this frame of conversations of what the MANA learning community has been doing in California for the last seven years has been uh, romanticized, as in like CSM has found the secret sauce. No, 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 no. We have not found the secret sauce. We have begun the conversations of how do we bring in um, effective support systems for our students. The guidance of my Talanoa today is that I want to have these kind of conversations and they're gonna be uncomfortable conversations to some of us if, if we have not been re reflexive in the last month or so. And if you have questions, please let me know. But in order for me to have you guys understand the picture that I'm painting, I have to change some words because some of us understand um, 
Some of us understand words based on the definitions that were given to us or that we're born with, right? Simple thing as in education, the simple conversation of the difference of education, um, the knowledge and the process of knowledge. Why am I bringing this up? It's because of this. When we're in school, we automatically believe that school, education, they're all the same thing, right? But it's not. And that's what my conversation of what research helped me do is that I understood so much about why our education system here in the Americas was not built to thrive. It was not built to help us. It was actually helped. It was actually built for us to be really good industrial workers or really good like labor market, labor workers. It wasn't for us to be any kind of CEO, CEOs or even teachers. I would say that they didn't even want us to be teachers because they even taught us the wrong things to teach <laughs> to teach the, 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 the folks after us. The Talanoa that I'm having today is also, it's a conversation and lessons from Doctor School of Education. One of the biggest things that I wished for in my doctor's program when I first started was like, oh, I'm about to do this. I'm about to kill the game. I'm about to kill the game. I'm about to do this and this and this. And then I couldn't even freaking finish my first semester homework. I was like, what? And so I knew that my seven years of education or practicing whatever I was doing at CSM, I knew that that was something really, really important. Or, or really crazy. But when I went into school and they were hitting me with this like culturally sustaining pedagogy and all these like uh, educational theories and I'm just like, oh, I, I didn't learn any of this. And then they taught us about history and theory. And I'm like, oh, I didn't learn about any of this. Then I kept telling my instructors because I was pissed about this one day. I was like, EPA can't be that bad. Like we have to have some history in our stuff. I told my instructor because I felt so frustrated that all history of education theory, I have no, not, no, no recollection of learning all this yet, yet I do this. Yet my leadership practices in my job, it shows this, right? It becomes this, this formation that I did without even knowing what are these, all of these educational theories. Then I started reading up on education theories and a lot of the education theories that talked about just the process of education was really telling us, was for real for real telling us that we are not enough. That whatever we have as a baggage, as people, you that won't make you successful in college because when you're in college, you have to learn what they want you to learn for you to get the job that they want you to get. So then I started sticking my head out and I started looking around to look for other theories. Can you go to the next one? And I realized about how much, can you go to the next one? Uh, sorry. I realized about how much of, in, of nothing that I, that I was taught. I, I realized how much I didn't know yeah, I didn't know how much I didn't know. And not only that I didn't know about American history, which is the real American history, which is formulated and founded by um, people of color, people who are being marginalized. I'm over here learning about George Washington being my ancestor. And then when I'm learning about Tongan history, like from Delhi and Kaili, I hope you guys went back to read that. I mean, to watch that because they're just amazing, amazing, amazing with that. They had this conversation of like, all the Tongan histories and cosmogony, <laughs> cosmogonies and deities that I have no idea about. So I realized maybe this is what my research is going to be about. Maybe my research is that I'm going to be researching research and how it pertains to my, to my community. And of course, the great Teresa Tawa, may she rest in peace, um, she says this, and this was back in 1993, that classroom as we inherited, it is undoubtedly a colonial space. It is extremely to, it, it is extremely difficult to indigenize, to indigenize the classroom, the colonial classroom. Because, and I wanna say this <laughs> on my own, um, just to add this, because it was designed to keep us down. It was designed to keep us in line. Can you go to the next one, Chate? And I feel like a lot of us have read about conversations of research and education 
um, just to be able to differentiate me from Kaili and and uh, Dr. Kaili and Esteli is that Dr. Kaili does anthropology. Um, uh, Esteli does religious studies um, at Stanford and I do education. So I really look at what the purpose of education is for, educa for, for the US, how we understand what the education institution can do for the labor market and three, basically how we can make more money as a capitalistic community or as a capitalistic country using our education uh, institutions. And this is what my research taught me when I was reading literature. First, we don't have any literature on us. Why? Because we have, we as Tongans or we as PIs have not been um, here for that long. Um, then I realized in education, what I was going through, what my classmates were going through, my time classmates were going through, was what actually everyone in the U.S. went through. Enrollment overall in the community colleges has decreased. So this is not a Pacific Islander problem. This is not a Tongan problem. This is an America get your shit together problem, where the overall in the overall conversations of higher education is already low. So why are we telling America, well, America already knows. The National Student Clearinghouse tells us all these things. And, and this is in 2016. In fact, because let me get a little nerdy here. In fact, since 2010, that was the peak when after the reception, after the recession in 08, the peak of student enrollment was around 2010. After 2010, y'all, that was when Obama was first uh, um, I, I said hired. O Obama was first voted into <laughs> into in, into that was 2010, 2008. Since then, it is 2021. It has continued to decline and decrease. Not and then when you look at NHPIs, of course we we have you see it in our capita the most. And when and when we do come to school, we don't stay. This is all what the literature is saying. This is what all the patterns of literature for our PI students are saying, is that national overall enrollment has decreased. Enrollment for NHPI communities has also decreased. When NHPI students go to college, we don't stay. Why is this significant? Because y'all over here in America blaming us that we're not doing well in school when it ain't just us. It's everybody here in America. And I like to say that a lot because, I don't know, it's just something that I like to. <laughs> but anyways, can you go to the next one? It just makes me, I guess it makes me feel really. Okay, so it makes me feel really, it makes me feel two things because, you know, we can't feel things just one. It makes me feel two things. It makes me feel like one I feel inadequate because even when I'm coming to school, I still can't pass y'all terms. And two, I'm realizing much, much more that this is actually the numbers that they want because they realize that our education attainment is also connected to poverty, is also connected to, to alcoholism, it's also connected to drugs, it's also connected to all of other conditions that the US is very, very responsible for. In this uh, report that you see in front of you, shout out to Dr. Inoke Hafoka from UCLA. This is what they did with the PIHA scholars. And if anyone in here is a uh, part of this, thank you so much for doing this report. This basically says that we are below average, NHPIs are below average in degree attainment. But this is what I want y'all to see is that even when it's hella high at 29%, if you look up, up top on the total population, it's 29% and we're really low for sure. But like, even in America, it's only 21% people going to school. So I'm like, I guess I'm the only one that sits here and thinks of these things, but I'm like, damn, ain't nobody going to school nowadays. You would think, you would think that the education institution would do better. To, to, to keep us because first of all, it ain't white men going to school anymore. It's everybody else, right? And so these formations of education, community colleges, four years in America, it was literally built for upper class white men. So when World War II happened, when Vietnam War happened, when the women's rights happened, when the civil rights happened, all of these were happening at the same time. Together, they all united to say education, higher ed has to be able to talk to us, has to be able to respond to us. 
But as we look at this, I'm saying, okay, the quality of education in the US sucks a lot. Let's look in more into that. Can you go to the next one? And in reality, if the, sh if the chief or the navigator of the ocean going canoe is unfit, the lives of his crew are endangered. It continues to go on with this quote, but it makes me realize that if the foundation of education was already unfit, we was already in danger to begin with. And so the reason why we have to think of this, like even Frantz Fanon says this too, is that it's the sense of, it's not just a matter of like, we're thinking of theories, just to think of theories and sit here with our little T, no, actually, we're thinking of theories because it's literally a matter of life or death. We have to think about theories because if we don't, our culture does not survive. So literally, yeah, exactly. By, by, oh, hey, mama, my cousin. Exactly. It's theory in practice. You have to understand that they inform each other. You know, and I think for me and my journey in education, I didn't understand that I already knew it. That I didn't understand that I was already built for this. Um, I was already preyed on this before I was even born, right? And we'll go on to that after this, but I'm trying to stick it to education theories for now because I feel like I'm just kind of confusing everyone besides with me. Um, can you go to the next one? And so what I think I wanted to talk about, like the more meat of my conversation here is like how I was able to come out of my doctoral program feeling like a motherfucking boss. Like that's how I was feeling like right after. Um, when, I, when I was going through my process of my doctoral process, I really, really, really was going through a lot of identity issues. And I love saying that now. I love saying, oh, my identities were crashing. They were crashing like lightning and storm because they were, and they still are. And in the beginning, I came out, the, like, I went into the doctor program, I'm like, I'm about to kill people, I'm about to do it, I'm about to change the game. And then I came out of the program, like, I just want to live today. I, Lee remembers, I just want to live today. And like, I feel like, because of that, I was realizing, like, as we forget, as we continue to unpack, we realize that whatever we understood about identity becomes in shambles. And everyone thinks that that's the end, but actually the beauty of Tava is that you're putting it back together again, right? <clears throat> Esteli Hafoka is my sis, but she's always talking ish about Tava reality, which I love, which I love she does that because she's a scholar, we're scholars, this is how we have conversations about theories. And uh, Deli says that it's because it's romanticized, which is totally true. Sometimes the way we implement theoretical frameworks, we can't help but sound all majestic and sound all, you know, uh, when we're talking about critical conversations, you know? And so me and uh, Shate were having this conversation on how I use Tava theory of reality. And I felt like, like, I'm gonna just be real because I'm not gonna try to act like I'm hella smart because <laughs> like when I first did Tava reality, it was more of a tongue and thing. Like, let me just say that. We can use any theory to talk about anything that we want. That's what I understand in education. In my doctoral program, they told us that. You can literally use any theory, and if you can connect it, every genealogy, it's perfect, right? But for me, I wanted every single part of my research to be me, even if it was going to not be as scholarly or like as like this really huge profound thing I just felt like I needed to get our voices out there so the title of my dissertation was Talanoa Amana validating Oceania students in a classroom and being able to understand what their social emotional and academic experiences are so how does Taba theory of reality move into this can you go to the next one? I'm going to really, really take you guys through a very, very fun, let's all smile. Let me see you smile, Siate. Fun. I'm gonna send you guys a very fun way of thinking of Tavaism, only because I am still learning. I do not know all the tenets. There's way more to this. If you guys understand critical race theory, and then you guys can understand Tava, because you guys will understand that critical race theory is this huge, huge thing, right? And we usually only take the race part 
or the white supreme, you know, like, like we'll take bits and pieces. So what I did is that I took bits and pieces of Tabaism and, and able to try to, try to chew on it. You know, when you chew on bubble gum, yeah, it took me a while. Taba took me like two days to chew on that gum. And, and the Taba reality theory is that I think of it like this. We are all in college. And we all understand that our institution is a colonial space. So what I did is I literally took that, <laughs> I literally took it and made it into this conversation of time and space. Tava is literally the manifestation, conversation, continuum events of time and space. And with time, how we're able to market is we either market with someone. So if I am the space, I am the person, I am the space, this is the top, it's me in a contextualized form of how I'm trying to understand reality. So I literally just stripped everything and went into time and space. If I think of the process of schooling or the process of Akko, Konai Helu talks about Akko as in this con as in the space where you're trying to learn and understand um, ilo or intelligence. Um, that's how I understand Akko. And so I wanted to redefine education because education is a conversation of US contextual form of space. And I'm using Akko as a very conceptual temporal time and space reality in my students. So one of the tenets of Tabaism is that knowledge is the acknowledgement of time and space, which is seen through the process of education. So like knowledge in, in investigation or the process of education is then used for practical processes like knowledge application. Linda Tuhiwai Smith said this really pretty. She was saying that the way that we think of education is school, building, principal, teachers, all these very fundamental Western um, identities or activities. When we think of Tavaism, we really think of community, family, um, and really re-identifying education, the knowledge or the purpose that education is for. That's what we're redefining in Tava. So what I wanted to do was really strip off all of this colonial space and really use a method. So Tava actually helped me put together a method that I can really implement as a research method and as a classroom pedagogy content. Can you go to the next one before I confuse everybody, everybody? And as I'm using this Tava, uh, method um, Taba theory in understanding stripping the colonial space with just literally knowledge and fluidity um, and uh, negotiation. I, I, I was really looking at this YouTube video, I'll put it on here, about Linda Tuhiwai Smith, about how she talks about research justice, the concept of research justice, and how we have continued to utilize, utilize research here for money in the US, not realizing how much power there is in research. One of the things that Linda Tui White Smith says that I absolutely love, 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 is that she talks about how we always use things to be able to get ahead of each other. But the power of research justice is sharing. And I don't think I've ever heard, yeah, I don't think I've ever heard of 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 a word called sharing and then also power being right next to each other, right? And I've never thought of that until she said it because people don't want to share. People don't want to be able to, to do that because you're going to get in front of me. But as you're thinking about community and when you're decolonizing these practices, you're realizing like research should be given at the forefront of the community it's serving. So if we are doing, why are all Tongan males football players or whatever, that the process of being able to understand that should come from the Tongan football players and their families. It shouldn't come from theories that has nothing to do with epistemology within Pacifica. So that's what I really understand what research justice means is that this is why Linda Tui Smith is a shiz is that she's really telling us as researchers, your research ain't shit unless it's changing um, tech, like 
um, unless it's changing intensive conditions for people of, of um, indigenous people, your research ain't research. Your research is literally just whatever you're trying to do to, to gain from. So she really pivots the game of understanding research. Why is this important? Because y'all, even though I became a doctor last year, it was not it was not a really pretty, pretty sight at all. And Dr. Kava is on here too, right? You on here, sis? Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. She on here, cool, yeah. You can always tell me if I'm wrong too, Lee, too. The reason why I really talk about this part is because this is what you have to go against with your institution that you are representing, right? Because how the F is SF State gonna hella claim me as one of their decolonial researchers when they didn't even want to pass me because some of my stuff wasn't wasn't um when no not they her the white woman when they, <laughs> when she didn't want to pass me because she said because she said it wasn't um rigorous enough and in my mind i'm like no you wanted me to fantasize the fact that harmony needs to be fantasized in taba in fact for me harmony is not fantasized without talking about tension you can only talk about harmony when you talk about tension. Anyway, let me talk about that. But like with this research methodology conversation, it made me realize that even when you at the forefront, gang banging your people, they're going to still tell you, you don't know what you're doing. You don't know what you're talking about. But I really wanted to bring this up because because of this methodology, I was able to say F off. Wait, let, me, let me try this before my phone. Okay. I was able to say... Um, I was able to say, uh, F off, I am rejecting Western construct of research, relying on one's version of the truth to speak for communities with multiple realities, ultimately constructs asymmetrical paradigms, politics, power, and the common sense of society, which is exactly what Taba conversations are, is that when we are in harmonious patterns, anything that clashes with the space will clash with the whole space, not just not 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 just this one, but all of it, which is why I saw Lee talking about how Taba is not a metaphor. It isn't. At the center of Western research is a Eurocentric lens. In other in other words, whatever we as Western research investigate is centered in our Western thinking, leaving no room for the morals, values, and ethics of the people, places, or community we are researching. And it sucks because sometimes I, you can go to the next uh, slide, Rich. And it sucks because for some people, we can say these things to be able to trump Western constructs of like being me being being at CSM, right? We can say these things, but we have to really put it in their front teeth or the front gap of their mouth for them to even really understand that I'm saying, no, 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 no. I'm not talking about research over there. I'm talking about this one right here in your face. But, you know, me and my committee went through a lot of stuff. And Dr. Lee Kava, Dr. Esteli Hafoka, Dr. Tanya uh, went Samu, all of my Pacifica female scholars had me covered and hugged through this whole time of like really feeling like crap. Because I have, again, me telling a white lady that I have to defend myself to her about literature that's about my people, right? Just crazy. Anyways, me, yeah, as we continue to think about research processes, I thought about even the way that I'm even making sense or making connection. And this is where uh, me and Dr. Lee really got into it. We got into the nitty gritty and really talked about why Takala analysis was my analysis for my framework. And the biggest surface level that I could talk about with y'all about this is that So like it will always be different when it's just our conversation than other conversations from outdoors of us. This Kakala framework or what, what Konai has been doing for decades and decades is that she's been able to set this foundation for us to understand this. Where the Kakala as the lay, as we all understand the, um, the lay, it, it provides a, a, a philosophy and a methodology, which is what I, I really hope that if you guys have questions about this, it's perfect because Dr. Lee's up in the house, she can answer it. 
Um, but I really like the, the sentence of Kakala requires me to utilize knowledge from global as well as Pacifica cultures in order to weave something that is meaningful and culturally appropriate for my students. So put it in the chat box if education is your research framework, um, just so that I know. But um, I also wanted to say that when I think about all of our education theorists, the folks who remind me of Konai Helu is Gloria Lanson Billings, uh, Laura Rendon. These are um, these are amazing educating scholars who in the U.S. have done awesome, awesome, awesome conversations about um, race, race, and about um, poverty levels here in the U.S. Yes, Pauline, for sure. Yes, for sure. Like because. Education that we see it today, there's a problem. It's a huge problem. Let's just say that. It's a huge problem for our education system today. And what we do as doctors of education is that we come over here and we tell you what the problems are in the institutions, and we have to continue to work with the institutions to tell them how to make this better, which is the reason why I brought up a method in my dissertation to see if it's something that I can utilize as a way to like do it this way and see if this works. If not, we can we can always fix it up. But the reason why Konai's um, analysis frameworks helped me so much making pieces is that I was realizing y'all that no matter what I say, what I do, non-islanders will never understand why we choose to not go to school or why we choose to not do assignments, right? And that was my favorite part of my research is that Kakala framework, Tava theory of reality, um, uh, research justice methodology, all these, th these three things weaved my notion together to be able for me to support my students. And my favorite part of all this was um, in order to weave something that is meaningful and culturally appropriate for my students. I thought that was super dope. Konai Helen so dope, next. And so I put together a method. It's also a pedagogical tool that you can use in your classrooms. What I use for Talanoa Mana is that I use David Fabai's definition of Talanoa. I use Tuhiwai Smith, research justice, I use that into framing of Talanoa Mana. And I also use Paris, of course, Pauline knows Paris, culturally sustaining pedagogy. And so can you go to the next one, Shate? And within these three conversations, I was able to put together this. It's a diaspora tool to complete writing, writing assignments. It's also this power conversation of validating students in the classroom using culturally responsive curriculum assignments. And then also, Talanoa Amana showed us the consequences of being able to validate students in the classroom. Like, you guys have gotten those amazing teachers who have really brought out the best in you in, in maybe one class or two classes. This is how, this is what we try to figure out in Mana Learning Community. Um, what is the best framework to support our Pacific Islander students? And then we use Mana as like our lab, our classrooms, we use it like our, as our labs to see what we can use. And then the students' feedback, what they give us is what we think, okay, we can take this or this, we can take this or whatever, you know? But the ultimate part of Talanoa Amana is that students get grades for the for all of the reflections that they turn in, all of the classroom lit, uh, lit reviews that they have to turn in, they also get uh, grades on that. So you're not only reading things that are relevant to you, you're also reading it the way that you can understand and process it. And then you're also putting it together to be able to submit for an assignment in class. That's what Dalano Amana is. Can you go to the next one, Tate? Am I talking a long time? I talk a long time. It's 50 minutes. In. Okay. Um, and through my research and through understanding a lot of Okay, so then what the hell is this for? Like, how am I gonna be able to make my research something that is useful and meaningful for my students? You know, oh, what I wanna do is I wanna do like a quality, I wanna do it in, in, in this Talanoa in a very qualitative way so that they can just be able to share what they share. And in this Talanoa Mana, this is what we got from students writing. 
no matter if our differences were different, if it was from a different side of the bay or out of state, if you were from a different denomination and practice our culture differently, we all learned that at the end of the day, we are ocean. So that understanding that there is no boundary when it comes to everyone in this room, because in this very room, I see my brothers and sisters' faces. I see my mom and dad's faces. And that's why mana has a lot to do with education. It is to understand that how I treat my education and how I treat my family, how I treat my faith and how I treat my God. When a lot of people see this, they're kind of like, oh, this is a nice kumbaya. <laughs> it's a nice kumbaya conversation. That's great. Unity is so great. We should always have unity everywhere. You know, and, and so everyone's looking at it and they're like, why did I pick it? I said, this is because this is the only time I've ever seen someone write all their identities all in one, like, you know what I mean? In one area and space, right? Where they're able to take all their identities. Now they're even telling each other that their classmates are their brothers and their sisters, right? That's a whole different dynamic in our culture. And we don't do that in our science class. We don't say, oh yeah. Um, Todd is my cousin now, We're, we share, <laughs> you know? So I understand that there are conversations you can't have in some places, but this is what Dalano Amana does. It brings people into spaces where they can talk about both their life outside of, outside of, um, of education and inside of education. So the next slide, these are just slides of students talking about why they come to school or why they do they, what they do. But most of these quotes are coming from them responding to NHPI literature conversations. This one is, uh, got here. Uh, I know for a fact that we all got here, we all have our struggles, but that's what got us here. It's what got me here. It's just something that will always keep my generator going. It gives us a different view of life to have struggles in our life while it's also being first generation students. I am sure most first generations do not go to school with a full stomach before class or even after class. So where is this energy coming from? I say the energy that keeps us going to fulfill the first gen journey is the energy within us that took that we took on from our hardworking parents. One of the things that I want to tell you guys is that this is his thought, but a lot of these words come from the words that he read about, right? So he's also picking up more vocabulary. He's also picking up, um, he's also picking up this conversation of understanding himself as a first gen. Some of my conversations is that us as PIs, we don't know what first generation, what, what, what does that mean? Like we don't, we don't get it. So where there's labels that are put on us at the same time, we're putting level labels on ourselves because of what we want for ourselves and for our family. Can you go to the second, to the, to the last quote? And there was hella other conversations in the dissertation that I would probably say you guys should just read because there's just a lot. I had a lot of um, themes in my chapter four. Please let me know if you guys want to talk about it. But I kind of just want to give you like more of the spiel of my trying to do a good job of like weaving my personal story, my professional story, and also my research story. Because a lot of times when I try to do that, I'm not able to do that. And I'm realizing that here in OKT, I can. Because there's a lot of conversations or assumptions that I don't have to discuss here. We just already know. And I am so thankful for this space, Siate. I'm thankful for all of you guys for listening to my rants. Um, and I'm sorry if I didn't make sense. Um, but I just wanted to to first say that at the end of all things, education is liberation to me. Education is for liberation with or, with or without whoever's doing it. Education is liberation to me. And the reason why it's liberating to me is because I have realized that this is something that has been preyed on from the beginning of what I should be doing and being able to support. My prayers have come all the time from trying to think about, am I EPA enough? Am I Bay Area enough? Am I Tongan enough? Am I research enough? Am I a teacher enough? And I realized that my dissertation was allowing me and all my identities to come together for one purpose and one goal. And that was to mobilize our Pacific Islander students um, in higher education. And on that note, I just wanted to say thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, Dr. Kidal.
Oh, well, uh, that was amazing. Um, I'll just give you guys a couple of minutes or a couple, of, you know, a minute or two to, to take all that in, uh, think up on some questions. Uh, wow, what an amazing, um, what an amazing fellow. No, I'm just going through the chat real quick to see if there's any questions dropped there. Um, oh, yeah. Feel feel free to unmute yourself or you can drop the question in the chat and I'll go ahead and read it um, for all of us. <laughs> okay, thanks, Pauline. I don't know if there's any questions yet. I have a couple of questions. Oh, it looks like Fina had mentioned a, a question about, and then Lee said there was a question about critical pedagogy. Support my advice. Yeah, and um, I mean, as we're doing all that, I just want to continue to just talk as we look for more questions, because um, I talk a lot. Um, the mono learning community right now is being uh, utilized at other community colleges. And right now I am currently trying to work with others to make mana a statewide model for Pacific Islanders. Um, and I think I wanted to bring this up because we can have this conversation in here. And although um, we are a Pacific studies learning community, we are very, very founded on Tongan theories and concepts, you know? That is something that I really need to fix. I need to really decentralize Polynesia in mana, um, because I think I should state this because I think it's really, I need to be accountable for this as well, is that right now mana does move and process through a Tongan lens. Um, a lot of it has to do with me. Um, a lot of it has to do with, this, with the community that we serve in the Bay Area-ish guys, it's like San Mateo area and EPA, it's mostly uh, Tongans and Samoans um, with more on the Tongan side than the Samoans because a lot of our Samoan families are also in CCSF at the Vasa learning community. So we're all very, uh, very entangled. Thanks guys for like not kicking me out. I think a lot of the conversations that I had for myself is like, how do, how do we make <laughs> scholarship conversations like accessible for everyone. And so please, if you have any questions or anything, like hit me on my DMs, um, I can really try to ask them. But go ahead, Pauline. Thank you so much, Dr. Tobo, for sharing space and for just being so inspiring and enlightening. And um, the question I had for you was, what touched me the most was the explanation of feeling the um, grounded and held up by other um, Pacifica scholars who you mentioned were, from my understanding, were women. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask you, because there is this um, understanding and criticism towards um, men of color, not really putting in the work for women of color, and I wanted to ask you, what are your thoughts when you were going through the situation of the institution not wanting to approve your dissertation? Um, were there men of color? And did you wish there would have been better work done by our Pacifica men in higher education to better provide and carve out space for Pacifica women? And Sorry, millions of questions, follow-ups. Okay, sorry, okay. Um, and do you wish this was a thing? What, what could our Pacifica men have done better? Because like you said, you're, um, the people you turned to, you were mentored by were Professor Kaili. And um, I also wanna say, you don't have to answer this. Like, feel free to get back at me in the DMs <laughs> because to honor Tawhiva. So thank you again. Thank you. Um, it was really hard for me to look for any scholars uh, when I first started my my, uh, my 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 program. One is like 
everyone keeps saying this. Oh, you can reach out to me whenever you want. But you don't because you're like, oh, I don't know what to say. I don't know if I have money. Am I supposed to give you money when I email you? Like, I don't know. <laughs> you know, and I feel like um, it's really hard to, to, to answer that question, Pauline, because I wasn't really around men who males of color who were very, who, 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 who ignored me. If anything, I have been around a lot of male of color who are basically unicorns because they give me my space, including Dr. Kaili. Um, he knows what he knows, but I think uh, there are just some types of leaders who you just vibe well with without research, right? Just in general, you vibe well with them. And I think that that's how I, was able to move forward with this. But meeting people like Lee and Telly, those were all very from Sisu kind of thing, you know? Uh, we, we all were either placed in um, spaces together because of uh, scholarship. Uh, I met Lee at UH when we were doing the textbooks. Um, and Telly, where did I meet you at? I'm pretty sure it was professional, right? Professional? I think it was professional. But I think that with them two, just literally with like one, I was able to find another one. And then I was able to find another one. And, and I think that that's how I was doing it. Um, my degree is different from Delhi's. Delhi has a PhD, which is a, 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 a doctor in philosophy. So does Lee, a, a doctor in philosophy. I have a doctor's in education, which my degree is very much more like pra practitioners mostly get my degree. Uh, folks who have been in the game for a while and they just kind of, you know, they kind of need that upper game level of just kind of getting more money in their form. So like vice presidents, uh, deans, um, presidents, people who want to be in district uh, chancellors, they get my my degree. Um, I kind of was thrown into it from my from my uh, co-workers. Had I had wanted to do it on my own, Pauline, I probably would have went through a PhD program and I probably would have gotten more of a collective. But working at CSM, my situation was very unique because I was working at CSM. I was putting together a program. I was getting a lot of instructors and faculty hires and stuff like that. So I would like to say that I didn't come down the route that the normal routes of, of a doctoral program. I mean, there's no normal route. Let me just shut up because no normal route either. Um, but because of that, I, I had already was given a lot of support before I even went into my, into my doctoral program. I also want to say, y'all, if I didn't already have the learning community together at CSE, you know what I mean? I don't think I would have pursued my degree. Some people, and Lee and Esteli can talk to this, or anyone that's on here, even Alisi, because I know you're also preparing for your PhD program, eh, 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 is that when you when you look at like when you look at my pathway i am 27 this is me a, a few years ago i am 27 years old i have this program that i really like doing pauline i really love being the minor program coordinator because i get to beat up kids and i get paid to do it you know it's one of those <laughs> and I hell love my job, but I feel like I'm running into every other person's problems. So like at the same time, the Uli Uli learning community was going through some issues. The Latinx learning community, they were going through some issues. They were going through a lot of like kid, kids not coming and sign up. And in my mind, I'm like, oh, I don't ever have that issue with mana. Like cousins of cousins hit me up. Like they'll say, oh, my cousin from somewhere, somewhere come in and they come in with so-and-so, you know? So we never had that issue. So I was, and I kept thinking to myself and I did not sleep for like a week. Cause I was like, is this it? Is this all that mana is gonna be? Are we just going to be this little awesome little boutique learning community that, you know, sometimes does this on photos and <laughs> does songs and we sometimes graduate, you know? And I wanted it to, and literally that became the essence of, okay, I'm going to drive it this way. And just the way that my personality is, I was already trying to find folks. Um, and Ka Kaili was just someone that I knew from a family friend. So I reached out. That's not to say that I'm going to say it right now, our males of color need to be at the forefront to share space, give space to us as females, because at the end of the day, no matter what, it will always be them before us in front of any presence. So I do believe 
in that. And I do believe that me sharing space with two of my male uh, mentees that are in doctoral program, one of them's here. Hey, Steve. Um, those two, to me, I always talk to about how important their roles are because of how many males of tongue, tongue and males that we need, you know, in our field and education. We need more tongue in, in, in uh, education, which is actually why I'm here, y'all. I'm here to recruit all of you guys to go work in the education system. <laughs> um, and that you don't just have to be a, a teacher or a counselor. There's way more things that you can do in higher ed um, that I feel like I'm off topic, but yeah, let me just go back to research. Yes, males need to give us space now, 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 Steve, now. <laughs> Sorry, Pauline, I don't know if I answered that. Okay, so it looks like we have a couple of questions in the chat. Oh, I just, I, I just, uh, it looks like Fina had a question from earlier um, before I get to other ones. Uh, she said, I would love to hear how critical pedagogy showed up in your journey through academia. Yeah, uh, it definitely showed up in person. Me, I'm the kind of person that like, you have to be what you tell me you are on TV. Does that make sense? Because the too many times I have put people on a pedestal and then I have been totally, totally like, you know, when you meet your dream and you're like, and, and like a crush because your dream lover boy doesn't even know how to, how to spell responsibility. But, you know, that's different. That's different. But I'm saying like, when I grow up to a space, I have to be able to be responsible for this space, both when I'm in the space and when I'm out the space. So when I, so when I go back to your question about critical pedagogy, I didn't really care for it until I seen it face to face. And so I felt it and so I talked to it. Gloria Lanson Billings. She is an amazing, amazing female of color, black woman scholar who has a conversation about pedagogy. She is informed by Bell Hooks. We love Bell Hooks, yes we do. And Bell Hooks is also on this conversation of pedagogy, critical pedagogy. And you know what I like about thinking about, when I think about ped critical pedagogy, y'all, I think about how we critic, are critical about feminism. So feminism to me is a very word that I've always used to, to use, but I don't really know what it means. So very recently in the last two years, especially being with Lee, talking about feminism and our queerness, all of our conversation of sexuality, I'm realizing, I'm realizing how much of criticalness has to come from our conversations that also give us tension. Um, and we don't do well with tension, huh, y'all? Even when I say tension, we're just like, oh, she gonna say something to me. And I totally understand. Um, and I think that that because of uh, pedagogy or critical pedagogy, wanting, wanting to hit it, my sole purpose of saying that it connects to feminism, queerness, and all that is because I, because I'm saying that it has to be right at the gut right at the most marginalized, the most unheard, the most one voice, the most blanketed conversations have to come out. How do we see that in critical pedagogy? You're teaching us shit on the textbooks that ain't even real, that you haven't even verified, but it's from some, some Pearson and Pearson math lab, you know? So it makes me realize that these pedagogy, even the way that we think of pedagogy, I guess I'm like the only one in education that wants to be in education. I guess I was the only teacher that signed up for CSM that actually wanted to be a teacher and not doing it because I already have a master's or a doctor, right? Like it's, 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 it's so weird that I have to put some teachers, I have to buy, have them buy in on pedagogy. And I feel like the only way that we can buy them in on pedagogy is talking about the knit thick tension as kind of critical conversations that we don't have. Um, and I used to always get this question, well, how can you teach critical pedagogy in biology or in chemistry? Because that should, in economy, I said, duh, bitch, teach the history. Because when you teach the history, you go right back into white supremacy. You go right back to, you, you know, you go right back to modernity. And I feel like it sucks that I have to tell these teachers to care about their job enough. So I have to tell you to care about your job enough. Then I got to tell you the pedagogy to use for our students. 
You know, what else I got to tell you? But it sucks because we have to say critical pedagogy for people to even take us seriously. Otherwise, for me, it's just pedagogy when you in the hood and you ain't eating. It's just, that's just the conversation. It's not critical. It's shit that we do every day. Um, let me shut up. Next question. Oh, no, it's beautiful. Uh, the next question comes from Patrick Hernandez. Uh, Patrick Hernandez says, okay. Malo Alpito Alpito. Um, thank you so much for sharing your research and learning and learnings with us. As someone who won't be engaged in education for some time, how can we educate and inspire others, especially rising generations, for example, our children, to walk beyond the traditional system of education? That's a great question. Yeah, so I'm not going to bullshit y'all. Y'all live like y'all educated, so I'm not going to bullshit all y'all. But uh, what's the, say the, say the question again? Because I, I was going to say something in the next <laughs> Okay, okay. Uh, Patrick's question was... Um, as someone who won't be engaged in education for some time, how can we educate and inspire others, especially rising generations, to go beyond the traditional systems of education? You know what's funny is that before I would always say that you're doing it already, y'all. These spaces, y'all, this the one, you know. But duh, you guys would be like, duh, bitch. tell me something I don't know, you know. Like, um, I think I would say like try something opposite. Right. I think I think for me, like you got to try something opposite. Ever since I've gotten my doctoral degree um, and you can even talk to those who have been in, in graduate, even your master's. When you when you are inspired by something, even if it's not in the education system, right, you have to follow through on that. So follow through on that essence that took you there and go with it. The reason why I say something opposite is because now I want to get into technology. Right. I'm this doctor in education and I'm trying to go into like the tech field. They're like, why? I was like, because my people need to be over there. Anyways. But like when I'm saying that when you have this feeling or when you you don't have to be in the educational space to be able to do uh, educational shit. Right. And what I'm trying to say in my research, if I'm trying to say anything, is that education ain't in the academic spaces. They ain't going to save us. And there's this uh, quote that I've seen, and you guys are gonna probably tell me who the author is, but the colonizer ain't gonna give y'all the tools so that y'all don't need them anymore, right? Ain't no one gonna give you the tools to liberate. I know you know which, who, who, who said it, just write it in the quote, cause I don't wanna plagiarize. But yeah, I didn't say that. But it was like the, uh, you, like the colonizers will never give you the tools for you to be able to dip, right? And so I, I continue to remember that. So now I have to figure out, okay, what in today's society can I do for me to be able to make a living and being able to support tongue and stuff over there or something like that, right? So that's what I want to say. Is that if you're not in the education um, academy, do whatever you are thinking of doing it and follow through. Because chances are, y'all, we got to get into these spaces that no one has done before. I have not seen lately a Tongan astronaut, and I'm just trying to see one sooner or later, or a pilot. I told my son, he five months, I said, I know you want to do whatever you want to do, but your side hustle is going to be a pilot because I'm going to put you in school. So whatever you do outside of education, do it for the benefit of everyone that's included in that space. Then you are doing Pacifica um then you are doing us what we're supposed i don't even know what to say anymore after that but yeah do what you do all know. right let me shut up <laughs> no for first talking an astronaut yeah man. uh i think and then, we, uh, uh, no i think we already have an astronaut y'all i'm not going i'm just saying recent 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 ones but i think we do have a tongue and astronaut nasa cool. yeah oh by the way y'all she's from east oakland she's like hey. 19 years old I'm, I'm going to look for her name and I'm going to send it to uh, to Ali to share it with y'all. She she has a contract at NASA. She's not an astronaut, but dope. She's talking. Yeah, we need more Pacifica people in STEM. Uh, then Alicia has a question. Uh, her question is, uh, Dr. Tobo, can you please share about how being in Tonga uh, contributed slash detracted from your research? I roll. <laughs> I roll. Oh my and, and I I roll just do the eye roll with me because oh my goodness yeah and Lee and Ellie are here so please speak up or anyone that has been in Tonga please speak up when you can yes, please honestly Tonga humbled the fuck out of me where I needed to sit the f down somewhere else like literally um we hella rep Tonga out here 
So when we go to Tonga, ain't nobody repping. <laughs> um, it's really difficult to have something in your mind that you want to do. But then when you get there, it's like not at all what you thought. Um, when I was first on my journey for my doctoral program, I had an opportunity to, that money came in and I was able to do something with it for Tongans. It was back in 2018. And I had asked some girls that I really respected in the field to join me while we try to figure out what we can do for Tonga. And, and I named the, the nonprofit after my students at CSM. So it was called the Vakatasi Foundation. We had a couple of students, we did not know what we we're doing. FYI, we didn't know what we was doing. All just rich American kids having a lot of uh, wood. Um, and so we went to Tonga with like this, we, we did this really big fundraiser. <laughs> We got hella money. Uh, uh, we got $24,000 to put materials into a container. Yeah, 25 rags, bro. Tongans in America got money. We sent that to Tonga. So Vakatasi was going to Tonga, right? <laughs> I'm sure at least you know some of these. Um, Vakatasi was going to Tonga to drop off this big container to take to whoever needed roofs for during for Cyclone Gita. We got there and we was definitely humbled because that's not what Donga was asking for. <laughs> they weren't even asking for that yet. Um, and the reason why I share this story with y'all is because, <laughs> I know Delhi's like, what? Then, first of all, because we had no noble name to our last name, <laughs> nobody was like looking at us. And I was realizing so much, at least like, how dare they do that to me? I'm in America, you know, I have to check my privilege right there and sit the F somewhere far away from everyone. Because I was realizing, right, like this Tonga that we have made in my mind, I literally just started going to Tonga in 2013. So mind you, I was going to Tonga as an adult. So I didn't really understand all the conversations of Tonga that I've had is here in America with my church and my family. All this is to say, we are so lucky that we were able to go with Honorable Hemanavaya to where that helped us with kind of like some of the meetings and then some of the meetings with students that I, that I had met with before, we kind of got together and put together something where we were able to work with Mori Tonga. So a lot of my experiences in Tonga really placed me, <laughs> placed me in my lane every single second place to me every single second in my lane and I realized how much more I am yearning I am yearning to see that as as normal rather than me seeing it like oh no it's only in Tonga and I think that being able to do that and really at least see looking um, and placing myself in particular spaces in Tonga to where I'm not only with one class system or with one identity, you know, with only like I'm really in the trenches with the Kilakilas. And that's what my baby daddy want to call himself. It's a Kilakila. I'm like, so I'm like, all right, cool. That's what we call any baby is a Kilakila. And I think that Lee's like, yeah. And I think that the boys of Seleka is like the perfect huh holy. They're like the perfect like um so the Ka boys, is, it, it's a Kalapu in Havelu. They're a Faikava Kalapu, but they're also a nonprofit organization <laughs> that does like dope artistic um, media, multimedia stuff for Tonga in communities all over the place. And when I'm with them, they literally call themselves Kilakilas. Like the mo like, and I, someone can bring up what Kilakilas mean, but the way that I understand Kilakilas is a, uh, I'm gonna just say that, that uh, they hood guys, they, they're from the hood. I'm just gonna say. <laughs> or that they're from. Yeah, Lee put a link on there. So when I, when I am with folks who are normally not in the limelight or folks that are not normally, shown because they don't have money or you know degrees or anything this is literally the most rawest form of tonga that i really appreciate because i'm realizing that i'm also participating in the rawness of tonga he. and um 
before I finish this uh, this conversation, I just want to say, because we're all in a safe space, I'm going to bring it up, is that I had a really good conversation with the president of Seneca, his IG that Lee just posted on thing. I had a really good conversation with him because of how diaspora Tawhiba and how Tongan Tawhiba. And I think a lot of it had to do with drama that we have with my cousin. <laughs> We're going to be all raw today. My second cousin from La Paja, me and her were having an argument. We were about to throw, th we were, we were about to throw bones in Malapo. Yes, we were. I don't care. <laughs> we were about to throw bones in Malapo, and we didn't. But, like, afterwards, it caused a really big rift, right? It caused a really big rift because she was also friends with my boyfriend's friends. And we were just all, like, all together. And she was still messing with she was still messing with my partner's friends. So again, you know, all this awkwardness. And uh, the president of Seleka one time was talking to me. He goes, no, it's just really interesting how much you understand of Tonga and then you don't. And I almost wanted to say, get out of my house. <laughs> and I really understood what he meant. He meant that there is a particular va that Tongans tauhi, that us as diaspora, so I guess in the beginning, I felt like he was attacking me, but he wasn't. He was making the observation. And I think I was triggering that observation that I'm the kind of person that's like, if we beefing, we beefing, y'all. We not, we not going to forgive the next day or whatever. Even though she goes, you're not going to forgive her? Even though she's your second cousin? So it's like one of these conversations that I've had. Yeah, right? I'm like, oh, well, am I less talking because I'm not forgiving toxic toxicity? <laughs> you know what I mean, right? So I utilize all of these very, very raw tongue-in conversations to come at me like that for me to be able to, to, first of all, not kick him out of my house, not get really defensive, but really sit there and think. Am I okay beefing it with my cousin, even though it goes against Tawhiba? From the way that I feel when I feel like I've been betrayed, hey? like I'm a cancer, y'all. We know what cancers are. We're very emotional. We're very sensitive. Yes, Baba was like, yeah, we're very sensitive people. So it's a very, for me, I was able to cut her off like right away. Like when it happened, I cut her off. After that, we would literally be in events for Seleka across the houses from each other and not say shit to each other, <laughs> right? And so, like, the president of Seleka comes and goes, oh, sai ko tonga muli peya, ko tonga tua peya. And I think I have to be, I have to build thicker skin for me being a Tongan diaspora in Tonga because they be coming for us, bro. And, and, and they don't do it. They don't do it on, there's no malish intention or anything, right? I think it's just the way that I see it. Because at least see over here, I'm Tonga Ma'atonga. I'm going to mate Ma'atonga. But in Tonga, I'm like, okay, I won't die all the way, right? You know, so it's like, you, you're, I guess my, just to say in all, my experiences in Tonga really tested, really tested my Tonganess. And I am proud to say, after coming back in December, I am proud to say that these tests I pass. Um, in my mind, I have passed them, right? I was able to uh, grow watermelons in Tonga with my, and my, you know, my, my, my homegirl Tofu here, she's the one that helped me pay for it too. Like I was able to grow watermelons in Tonga. So when he said that to me, I kind of was like, that's not for me to carry, hey? I'm not gonna carry Tonga Tua as something um, negative to me because it's, it's not, and I and I have to understand that Tonga Tua means outside of Tonga. I'm not an outsider. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I don't know. So it's all to say that you get the most purest, rawest form of Tonga, and you can't control it. That's why I love experiencing my life in Tonga. Is because I don't have control over what I don't have, and it's right in front of my face. And I think that that's what uh, I really, uh, really value tongue and epistemology. And, you know, I have to say it again, Deli, just really uh, watching your OKT talk. If you guys haven't, Siate, please link that link on there. Uh, Deli's conversation 
of uh of Tonga and the language of Tonga and her journey is definitely definitely very um deeper than my everyday uh, rawness, pureness <laughs> conversations of tongue. But I really think that we needed to understand this, y'all. And I'm gonna make this really like like clear. You have to go back. You have to go back to our Fanua to understand what I'm talking about. Like it's different for me to talk about Tonga than for me to talk to you in Tonga from Tonga, you know, for you guys to go to Tonga and understand it. And I have never to this day still have not ever met someone that went to Tonga and came back and was like, they didn't accept me. Like Tonga is a, 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 a great place to go and be tested. But I also believe that like, it also helps me understand that I couldn't have anywhere to run to. You know, I'm see like over here, it's cool if they don't call me Tongan cause I'm EPA through and through, you know, feel me. But like, in Tonga, when they tell you not Tonga, you're like, okay, you're right. Let me just, <laughs> let me just dip. And as a researcher, I just realized how much different and unique us as Tongans have to understand research. Because we understand life in heliaki form. That's met, a metaphor form. And one of the conversations that, that uh, Tevita and, and Teli were both having in their talks is that things can mean seven things. We are a multi-dimensional, multi-layered spiritual being that like, even with my conversation of research, I would advocate for you guys to all do more research on research and really looking up Linda Tuiwai Smith, the conversation of what, why we gotta take research back. Yeah, Lika, we are beat around the bush. And you know, <laughs> I'm just gonna say that uh, we are, I feel like we are beating around the bush because I mean, Delhi gave you guys a conversation of religion and taboo and tapus. We are always gonna beat around the bush because it's our, it's our protocol of conversating to like seven versions of ourselves. I, I like to think of Tongans that we have seven versions of our spirits. And because of that, that's why we can't make it on time to anything. <laughs> hey, Fee, um, what's it called? Did you want to uh, plug TRA, uh, the research? Yeah. Uh, mm, thank you for reminding me. Yes, definitely. Yeah, so this year we're having our 18th, annual, 18th biannual Tonga Research Association Conference, where it's all Tongans, all Tongan scholars, um, but it is not only mandated for Tongans, everyone can come. But basically this is where we really centralize Tongan epistemology, Tongan methodology, Tongan theory, Tongan everything in research. Um, we are having some awesome lineups of groups. We even have uh, speakers from the Ta 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 Ta. We've had uh, uh, Dr. Siwa Laftani saying that he's coming through, that's Delhi's mentor. Uh, we're still waiting on a couple of others. We have Malakai, um, Kolo Matangi. We have, I'm still waiting on Konai Helu to see if she'll respond. We have more, we have a lot of Tongan scholars that, um, that are also coming. And we also have 15 presentations from Tongan diaspora folks that will be there. So they're all over the world. Um, and I will keep you guys updated with the links because I think Delhi, we're having the Friday as a, the Friday is the virtual, but we're going to try to put all of it on Zoom just so that you guys can um, be with us. The link is in the, the link is in the chat box. Multiplicitous, can't even say that. Word. <laughs> yeah, right there, it's, uh, it's the 18th, yeah. And uh, it's in Laie at BYUH in Hawaii. So if you can come, Deli and I will be there. Um, so you guys can definitely come so we can chop it up more. Perfect, perfect, okay. Um, if there was no uh, no other questions, I'm just gonna just gonna go ahead and close the space. I just want to thank everybody so much for coming. Um, I want to thank Dr. Finao Tobo for always making time for my uh, my multi requests. Uh, Fee always pulls through, you know. If it's for the community, Fee Fee will pull through no matter what, you know. So um, I appreciate that so much. Um, thank you for the note takers and the reporters, Pauline. Thank you so much. And then uh, if you wanted to take a quick quick uh, group photo, you don't have to. Um, Turn your camera on if you don't want, but we just